The information provided in these episodes is for entertainment purposes only. It is not a guarantee of success or to be construed as advice of any kind. You should always seek advice from local licensed professionals before making any decisions. The dictionary defines an entrepreneur as a person who organizes and manages any enterprise, especially a business, usually with considerable initiative and risk. People often start a business without much choice, perhaps due to a job loss or just being dissatisfied at work, and they come up with an idea they just know can be successful. They become entrepreneurs by accident. That is to say their success or failure happens by accident, not with intention. My name is Mitch Beinhacker. I'm a corporate attorney and a business advisor. You're listening to The Accidental Entrepreneur, my podcast about how to achieve success on purpose, not by accident. Join me along with our monthly guests where we share our knowledge and help you get a hold of your business. And now on to today's episode. All right, welcome to another episode of the show. We, I always say this, but you know, we have another great guest. We're meeting some great people over the last five years. We're coming up on five years in uh, February. And um, yeah, if you're listening on your favorite podcast directory, please leave us a five-star review whenever you can. If you're watching us on YouTube, subscribe to the channel, like the content so we can keep uh, connecting with people like Scott, who's coming on the show in a minute. So let's get on with today's show. All right, Scott Ritzheimer, right? Is that correct? Am I good? That's it. You nailed it. Well, with Bein Hacker, I got to learn how to pronounce last names. So, yeah. So I appreciate coming out. Where Where are you? Uh, where are you located? I'm down in Atlanta, Georgia, just oh. outside the perimeter, as we like to say. Nice, nice. Do you have a cousin in uh, the north, uh, Alpharetta? Yep. Yeah, Roswell's a cool little town. We went for dinner. We're right across the river. Oh, there you go. Cool. Yeah, you guys have like ridiculous traffic problems down there i'm no idea. <laughs> <laughs> you know that's what everyone who visits atlanta oh, says like most folks who are from atlanta will just you know we find a way around it but it. yes I know. it's not a fun it's place to drive two hours to get there i'm like it's only like four miles you know yeah. <laughs> yeah that's 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 pretty funny all right so we're gonna talk today about you know i'm not i'm i'm curious as to where the twenty thousand number comes from twenty thousand businesses so you'll share that with me but maybe we want to get, go back first and talk about your background i usually do that and share you know your little journey and then we'll start talking about all the things you're doing in terms of helping people to scale does that make yeah. sense okay absolutely well these two stories are, are actually kind of one in the same uh okay. so i might be able to answer both for you but <clears throat> uh, i love the the name of this show because it's how i've introduced myself for the past several years now uh I started it totally by accident now uh, a slightly different set of circumstances, though, that led up to that. So mm -hmm. I was I was actually in ministry at the time and was looking to pay the bills, just get a part time job. Right. That That's all that I wanted. Uh, and uh, met a guy who lived nearby who had a business and started working for him in like the proverbial mailroom, if you will. I was I was answering emails that came in. Yeah. And uh, and so. About three months after I start there, he, he does a deal, sells the company, and owner finances it. Okay. And yeah, what kind of company was it? 
this was a company, uh, it was a company called Start Church. So it helped start churches. Uh, back in that day, we started churches, but based on the name, now we branched out quite a bit in later stages, but uh, helped folks that were getting started from zero to nothing, uh, from nothing to something, zero to one. And uh, was bought by a, another company who was in a similar space. Um, wonderful people, uh, you know, very intentional leaders. And I watched them over about the next eighteen months systematically, but unintentionally destroy the company. Yeah, and and, and almost destroyed theirs in the process. There were so many things that went wrong during this time, yeah. and, and I had a front row seat at it. Uh, I was uh, I was one of the thirteen employees that came went all the way down to two and a half employees. I was that half. Right. And, and um, the, the thing about the story that's interesting is there's no bad guy in the story. Right? There's no right. villain that was trying to mess it all up. It's just the acquisition is the easy part. The, all the, it's all after that. That's the really hard part. Yeah. Running and, and, and inter integrating and all those types of things. People think they're good at it just because they can buy a business. Yeah. And, and, and yeah, there's so many ways that it, it went wrong. But again, I had this kind of front row seat to see, hey, here's how it's not working now, right? Here, right? Here's how a transition doesn't work at all. And in the midst of what was a really difficult time, like even for me, I mean, I was just, I, I could feel the weight of it. I actually went to the doctor. I thought I had stomach ulcers. It was just, it was really heavy. All right. And, yeah. And I had like nothing in the fight. It was a part-time job. You know, I can't imagine the magnitude that they were feeling yeah. uh, at that time. But um, long story short, uh, they get about 18 months in and they just throw the, the white flag. Like this is, this is, we've taken it as far as we can go. We've given it our best shot. It's not going to work. If we keep going down this road, it's going to sink our company too. So they called the previous owner and they said, hey, uh, we're, we're done. We're going to declare bankruptcy. If you want this thing back, we'll give you a first shot at it. You can have it back. It's yours to try and do whatever you want with it. And, uh, well, so he's or anything. They didn't. No, no. Uh, and, and yeah, we won't get to the whole financial side of things. It's just, it wasn't pretty. Um, and so, you know, he goes immediately jumps in, uh, they said you have 24 hours. So he jumps in a U-Haul and drives, uh, uh, up to where they were located in Nashville and says, Hey, uh, you know, we'll take it back. We'll take whatever the assets are that are left. And at this point, it's like three computers that don't quite work anymore. And one of those office chairs that like all the padding is worn out of the bottom. That's all that was left of what was uh, over a million dollar company just a, a, a few, uh, a year and a half prior. Yeah. And so he calls me from the U-Haul and he's like, hey, this is what's going on. Um, I know you'd express some interest in, in seeing the company succeed. Would you like to come back on with me as an owner and help me to you know, at least take our shot and see if we can rebuild it? Now, this is September 2008. Not a great time to start a business. Yeah, real estate was in the toilet. Absolutely. So our first, you know, our first six months, uh, we're just watching the world around us implode. And... Mm -hmm. And, you know, in the kind of typical entrepreneurial way, uh, we're just, we've got no other choice than to make it work. You yeah. know, we went, you know, we didn't get paid for a while. And it was like, well, you know, a lot of people are not getting paid right now. So I guess this is about as good as it gets. Right. And, uh, you know, again, long story short, we were able to make it work. Uh, we were able to get the phone ringing. We were able to make sales happen. We were able to actually bring back some of our, our, our previous staff. And uh, we really just hit the ground running. And that started what was just an exceptional run. Uh, we were doing double, close to triple digit growth for, uh, uh, I think in the intro, I said 10 years, but it was for uh, about 13 years okay. uh, uninterrupted. And, and we were doing it again. The company was called Start Church. We started with churches. Then we realized, hey, you know, ministries need help. Then we realized, oh, other profits, nonprofits need help. And then we realized, businesses need help too. And so we started branching off into a wider and wider audience. And, and that's where that, that 20,000 number comes from. Is there are 20,000 different entrepreneurs, founders, both in the business space and in the nonprofit space. And they would, they would basically look up how to start a, you know, how to start a church, how to start a consulting business, how to start a fill in the blank. And we'd be one of the top Google searches. And so we we're getting in at the ground level with these folks. And uh, it was just, just, I mean, a luxury when you, you look at, at from a career perspective, the opportunity to see, you know, 15,000, 16,000, 17, 20,000 different founder stories sure. firsthand.
was was really a remarkable opportunity. Yeah. So you almost were like restarting your own business that was help other businesses start because yeah. your business has been, had been devastated and you know mo lost most of its customers and employees and everything. And you kind of had to figure out how do we fix this and what did they do wrong and then what happened to the other company they were gone they went out of business and the other company survived they, they're doing great to this day uh we have uh we have a, a pretty good relationship with them yeah uh it was some strain there but uh no they did fine once they recentered on what they did best uh and they, they got their focus back they did really well was that the, I mean, now you're doing all the scaling, so you understand it better because you've gone down 20,000, you know, projects. Was that the problem with that they were really, even though it was, they were complementing industries, they really were out of their, out of what they focused on. They should have just stayed with what they're focusing. You guys did this, they did that. Is that really what the problem was? Yeah, I think if they had to do it over again, um, I think they would probably say they bought a business and gave up its big. It's it's really one and only asset, right? The the business was highly highly centered on the skill set of the founder at that time, and, and that was something that took us years to reverse. Uh, yeah. And uh, and so that was one of those things. Like when you go through a negative process like that. You start thinking, hey, how can we build this differently? And that was an active right. sure. thing for us. Yeah. Yeah. I think during the pandemic, a lot of people had to deal with that, right? Resilience. How do you turn things around? And I think that's a huge problem with small business owners. They become too dependent on, it's not always the owner. Sometimes it's some person who was like the office person who was working for the owner. And now he or she runs the whole business. And, you know, you almost have to say, listen, we're going to pay you, but we want you to take the next month and a half off. And we're going to see if we can run this company without you here, you know, yeah. because we, you know, businesses become very dependent on, on, on things like that. But that it's interesting that the business that you were in was almost the reason that you went out of business because they yeah. were able to do what you were doing for people yeah, and helping. Yeah. That's a great irony of the story. You know, I, I think you can turn that around and say, we had to do it twice to prove that it, the first one wasn't a mistake. You know? <laughs> yeah. No, but it, it did prove that. I mean, it's a good case study, right? People say, well, why should I hire you to help me? Well, we built a good business and then we sold it and they weren't able to build the business. We took it back on its knees and we built it again. So, yeah, yeah I mean, it's a, it's, it's a good, it's a good uh, testimonial to yourself, right? In terms of how you do it. Okay. So. That was two thousand. Well, you took the business back in two thousand eight, right? That's right. Okay, and That's right. the business is still going now, but you don't own it anymore. That's right. So uh, fast forward uh, a number of years, um, we, we we had you know it was, it was hard in, in the sense of like it was just a breathless sprint across the finish line every day. It felt like, uh, but we were winning, and so it was worth it. You know, it's just it was a lot of fun to to you build something and and see it shine. And as we started growing i remember it was like we hit around the six seven million dollar mark something changed right and and i i couldn't really put a finger on it i didn't really know what it was but something about it got harder again really uh that was the first time that we uh you know we kind of had this recipe of if we wanted to grow we would add a sales rep we'd add a couple of consultants and you know that was a million dollars a year that was basically our strategy we like to think it was a lot more complex than that but it wasn't and, and yeah, and that worked great until it didn't work. You know, we brought someone in, and it was seven hundred fifty thousand. It's like, okay, that's fine. We brought the next year in, someone in, it was five hundred thousand, and uh, and and across a, a number of different places, you can't just say it was one sales rep because it wasn't. There were there were just things started to feel a degree or two off. There were there were the folks who were there in the basement days, you know, and and then there was the new people who were coming in who didn't quite understand that. They there were. You know, leaders who had we had built from the ground up, and then there were other leaders that we had hired in, and and there were just these kind of differences and rifts, right? Sales was feeling the pressure, and so you know they were pushing in one direction, and then our consultants were feeling the pressure of like, hey, what in the world did you just sell, right? How are we supposed to do that? And we just started to see kind of conflict and complexity popping up all over the place, right? And that would be one thing if it was just that, but you know this from the world of founders and entrepreneurs, it's also super, super personal because when you've got someone who's not keeping up, you have a manager who's not keeping up in a small business, they're probably a really close friend. So not only do you have uh, the the whole management side of that, how do you, how do you correct things when a manager is off? But there's like, 
am I really going to fire a friend? Right? Mm -hmm. Is that what this has become? Yeah, that's a lot, often why people hold on to people that they shouldn't hold on to. Yeah. Friendship. And so for us, while we were able to continue to grow our top line, what was becoming really, really concerning was our bottom line. Yeah, we went from you know high twenties on our profit margins to uh, you know down into the single digits over the course of about three years, and it's like something's got to give, right? The more we sell, the less we keep, and and I found I thought it was just me, right? But now that I'm I've been working with so many other founders, now that we've been uh, on on later stages of their stories, yeah. I've started to see that a, a, a very common. Uh, almost universal principle is that founders will go through this later stage that feels like this is it, you know, like this is about as far as I can take this thing. This is, this is as big as our company can go. This is as far as I can take it. This is as, as much as we can sell some type of lit ceiling that we, we start to bump up against. And, and we start to wonder like, is this really as good as it gets? Is this as far as I can take the company? Right. And and it was at that stage that we really started looking out for help, right? We we, we started reading the business books and, and implementing them, and they were helpful. Uh, we started to go out and try and find some coaches and advisors, and mostly for the fact that we were really bad at picking the right ones, but also because a lot of coaches are not very good at picking their clients, we lost more money on following the bad advice of coaches and consultants than we did in any other bad decision we'd ever made as a company. It was just like a bad match with your business and your problems, and it wasn't the right, like they all, yeah, I mean, it's common, right? Attorneys are like this too, right? They think they can do everything, and you can't. I specialize, everybody specializes. You can't be a generalist anymore. Now, so it was that what the issue was that you had sound like you had uh, what I call a silo problem, like as businesses grow, divisions of the company stop communicating and they're all kind of dealing with their own problems and they're not taking into account that, hey, if I work with this department, maybe we can solve both of our problems. And some of that's leadership. But I also think, like you said, sometimes it's for the entrepreneur to say, hey, this is bigger than me. I need to get a guy who's used to working at that level not the level that I started at. I think yeah. that's very hard for emotionally for business owners that have built this business and feel that they have to be, right, the person who guides this ship all the yeah. time. And yeah. The real successful guys that I've met and have had on this podcast don't feel that way. Yeah. They're more than happy to say, this is not my expertise. This is what Scott does. I'm bringing Scott in to deal with the scaling issues and I'm going to do this, you know, whatever. Yes. Yeah. So how did you find find the right uh how many frogs did you have to kiss to find a prince yeah <laughs> we kissed a couple of them uh it was a great great illustration yeah. uh so what that does though and, and for anyone who's out there who's like I, i've i've had that experience and, yeah, and i've well, been I, surprised I, by this like yeah. I, I i am a coach and consultant now so saying this from within inside the industry it, it's it's pretty broken at the moment. I actually travel around the, the country. I teach CEOs how to scale their businesses. And one of the things that I asked for a while was, how many of you have had a coach? And to, to my surprise, it was like nine out of 10. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if that was just the, the groups that I was speaking to or, or if that's universal, but it, everywhere I went, nine out of 10. And then I, I started thinking like, well, why are they still having trouble? And I said, well, how many of you that have had a coach have had a bad experience with a coach? A lot of Nine people. out of 10 of those hands. Right. Yeah. It's, it's like, just something fundamentally wrong with it. People. Yeah. It's just, and they don't have a process for like figuring out, there's no real definitive process for figuring out how do you match with me? And is that the right yes. way to, to do That's exactly it. it. So like, there's a couple of things. I'm going to try and be your guy. Yeah. Yeah. And, and there's a few things that happen. One, coaches and consultants are generally wonderful people. Like it's not that there's a bunch of shizers out there trying to steal money. Any industry has that, but that's not what's going on. No. Fundamentally, where we got it wrong was we were hiring people to do what worked in the past that wasn't working anymore, instead of hiring people who could help us know what we needed to do to get to the future. Makes sense. Makes sense. And because keep doing what you were doing and have a bad result that then think all that, like the definition of stupidity or something. Just That's insanity. Yeah, I think. And, and, and so we were hiring people to help us, um, 
to help us, you know, get our our existing strategies to work, uh -huh. what we really needed to do is hire someone to help us understand what the next set of strategies needed to be and get to the next level. Right. And and we banged we uh, capable of recognizing that at that point, right? No. I had no idea. I mean, I was 20, 20 something, just early my 30s, you know, my first executive team meeting I led. Like I had no idea what I was doing. Yeah, well, you know, trial by fire, right? Yeah, and for a lot of accidental entrepreneurs, it's the same way, right? They don't have MBAs. They've not done this nine times. And uh, and so what that, that does, though, and what breaks my heart about this whole situation is the isolation that I felt in the process. If I can't figure it out, that sucks. Right. If I can't find someone to help me figure it out, I am completely alone. Of course. Of course. Because then you think, then you get the hopelessness. Yeah. Like, okay, I couldn't solve the problem and I can't find somebody to help me solve the problem. Now, what do I do? Yeah. So, and, and, and that's listen, people listening out there. That's not, that's not a real feeling. Like you just haven't found the right person and you got to keep looking and you got to keep kind of, you know, fit, fitting it in, you know, whether you're looking for a, I'm, right now I'm in the process of getting a virtual assistant because I don't really have an assistant. I used to have a lot of employees, got rid of them, but I think it's going to take me a while to find the right person that can do the things that I want them to do. And it may be painful for a while. I may have to fire somebody. I may have to move on. I, whatever. Yeah. Don't give up is what I'm saying, right? And I guess yeah. you didn't at some point. You just started. Yes. Right. Well, and and I didn't have the palate for which which someone could misunderstand what you're saying and say just just you know spray and pray, right? Just keep hiring until you find someone. That's I nice. just didn't. I lost too much money doing that. You know, as we're the cost of it. Yeah, you know, I'm not talking about like consulting fees, I'm talking about the million dollars of lost revenue because yeah. of, of bad advice. And, and and that's an expensive way to figure it out. It is. What turned the whole thing around for me uh, and, and has just fundamentally shifted both that business, my perspective on business as a whole, and even my job now yeah. it is a, a, a little book. It's behind me. It's called Predictable Success by a gentleman named Les McEwen. And I actually heard about it on a podcast like this. Okay. Les was on a podcast talking about the most exciting topic in the world, business life cycle stages, right? I, I almost fall asleep just saying it now. It does not sound interesting at all, but what captivated me was his descriptions of these stages, particularly stage three. It's called Whitewater. It okay. was like he had a camera in my office. Right? As, how in the world does this guy know what we're experiencing? Uh, and And what that Whitewater stage is, is where the complexity from all the success by doing the right things in an earlier stage that accumulates complexity to the degree that it overcomes our ability to 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 execute to deliver consistent quality to yeah. meet the needs of our customers that's what springs up the silos that you talked about so it springs up right. the leadership challenges it's it's what necessitates great management it's what causes us to have to rethink our strategy and adopt a more holistic approach to business growth. Yeah. We couldn't just work in our business. We had to work on it. B big time. And, I, and I, I think at that point, people don't realize as small business owners that leadership doesn't apply to when you're only at J&J &J and Microsoft. Like it's, it's really important to, you know, direct and lead the people so they're on, you know, they're following what the goal of the company is and that they do work together. But I, I don't know, do you think that, Nine times out of 10, this is an inevitable like seawall that you're going to hit and you got to learn how to get over it. Or is there things you could do ahead of time to prepare so you don't hit that wall? That's a fantastic question. Uh, it is an inevitable and invariable stage of development. Now, that's not all bad. Doesn't mean it's the end of the world. In fact, a lot of folks will hear it and think that it's the end stage, right? Stage seven, death rattle. It's not death rattle at all. Yeah. In fact, Whitewater is just one stage away from the peak profitability, scalability, enjoyability of your business. So you can't skip it. You, mm -hmm. you, and even from a sense of preparing for it, uh, it tends to be a little futile. For example, one of the things that you have to do is you have to you have to add a brake pedal to the organization. You got to have the ability to say no to some things. Mm -hmm. And if you think about an analogy of you know that early company is like a bicycle, and and you just to go faster, you pedal faster, right? right. It, it, and you're not really on the brakes a whole lot if you're trying to go faster. 
Well, if someone says, hey, you're going to need to break at some point in time, you're, you're in for this really difficult stage. Here's a set of brakes from a, a, a sports car. Go ahead and put those on your bicycle so you don't run into that problem. Well, a couple of things are wrong with that. One, it's ridiculously heavy and hard to get it to fit on your bike. So it just is going to be clunky. It's going to get in your way. It's not going to be all that helpful. And two, the moment you tap those brakes, you're over the handlebar because it's way too much stopping power. Of course. So, so that's, that's, so, that's a very good analogy. The goal is to figure out how to grow your organization as simply and as quickly as you can for as long as you can. But here's the catch. The thing that you can do to alleviate the pain of whitewater is by recognizing it as fast as possible. Okay. By recognizing th that, hey, the game has changed, that's what allows you to, to make that transition, to change your strategy at the right time, to bring in the coach or consultant who understands that shift that has to happen and can guide you through the, the process for making it. I think that's true with a lot of business things, right? Consciousness, not self-consciousness, but being aware of the process. That's why I think a lot of business owners struggle because they don't take the time to become students of business in general, not necessarily of their business. Maybe they know their business very well, but they don't become students of business. And then you, and you have this experience, I'm sure too, Scott, where you see a business owner who goes from like he sells his business, he exits his business, starts a new business, but because he wasn't a student of business, doesn't work for him. Like his first business, he knew. He grew up in that industry. He was apprenticed in that. Whatever it was, he could make it work. And now, and now he's struggling. But I think that if we are aware of these things, then sure, then we can recognize them as they come and say, oh, I understand what's happening. Our departments are getting a little bit off the track and nobody's talking to each other. We got to start having, and maybe I can't handle this. Maybe we got to bring in a consultant and maybe ultimately yeah. I got to bring in a new CEO. I don't know. Um, but yeah, I think that's, that's right on point. Yeah. And it's, it's this idea of being a student is really important, but it's not enough. And this goes straight to the, the heart of the issue that you mentioned beforehand. Oh, yeah. I, I think the number one question that we need to ask ourselves in business is not, you know, how do we have success? What do we need to do to succeed? Why are we in this business? Uh, who do you need on your team? Those are all very important questions. Don't get Here's me wrong. Yeah. But there's one question that, that changes the business? answer to Perhaps all of those. And that is when are we? Running. Right. right? What Weber stage are we in and what is appropriate for this stage? Business. Let's take the, the guy who has been down this road before, right? He gets through the early a stage. He gets through the second stage. We call it fun. And he gets to white water and realizes, oh, As we need more systems and processes. We need more people who think in terms of system and process. And that Aweber, works the and they scale and it's awesome and he market. sells and he goes and starts over, over and he's like, years, I remember when I didn't have all those systems and processes, and I don't want to feel that way again. We're going to start with the right systems and processes. Radically improve their and then they just, I see this all the time. They pour into and they've got beautiful systems and processes. Their CRM is pristine. They've got contracts tracks for everything strategic no tools and customized go. strategic and planning they're workshops broke. Right? They're just absolutely can broke because to your business that's not what creates success in the you early and stage. Family. So by recognizing what stage we're in, and affordable that's service when we can focus on the things that are most effective in that stage. Risk -free. That's where we can use are you struggling it as a with managing filter advertising to go find the people both on our team and the consultants and coaches and advisors outside of our team that are appropriate for this stage that we are in. GSM yeah. Growth no, no, Agency is your reliable yeah, partner a lot, in overcoming a lot to be these about business that. challenges. A lot to be said about that. I appreciate Feel the impact Okay, why don't we do this? Let me break for a little commercial. I got a couple of sponsors, goals, as you heard at the beginning of the show. Also to build and uh, we'll break for that, and, and then we'll come back and success. start to talk about the things you're doing for people. Embark on an exciting journey to redefine the possibilities of e-commerce. Continue to talk about the mistakes that people make. Maybe you have some stories excellence. about some people that are doing it right. Take decisive action now. Maybe you have some other books. Follow the link in the show notes. That's when you saw me come off camera. I was writing down the name of your predictable success. That's conducted by a GSM so let's take a break and we'll come back. Propel your e-commerce game to new heights with GSM Growth Agency. Follow the link in the show notes to learn more about all of our sponsors. And now back to our show.
All right. Uh, so I appreciate your patience. Um, yeah, so let's keep talking about it because I think all this stuff is really important. I've had a couple of guys on here who are, they consider themselves process scientists. One guy's building a website for managing teams and so forth. Um, and uh, I think it's, a, it's an interesting, uh, I think that's the one thing is that if you talk to a business owner, even if they're successful, right, they're being successful, they can't really like describe and tell you what's the process for doing this. Like they don't, they're not going to hand you a bunch of manuals. Oh, Scott, no, no problem. You want to learn how to you know, run and edit our podcast? Here's a book and here's how you do it. You want to run the office from over here? And I think that that's a, a real, I guess that's what, that's how they have the problem. They run into what you called whitewater, right? Because they don't have yeah. those processes in place. Is that true? Yeah, it's a big, big part of it. And one of the things that I would highlight is that uh, I found that success is much easier to define in terms of principles than it is in terms of practices. Okay. And so one of the things that we'll do is we'll go out and we'll ask someone how they did something, right? Instead of really getting to the, the root of why did you do it that way? Right. And, and uh, Jim Collins talks about this, and I think it's uh, either great by choice or how the mighty have fallen. But he says, when the language of success, this is what we do and this is why we're successful, when that replaces the keen understanding of, hey, this is why we're successful, but under these conditions, we would no longer be successful. It is at that point that an organization begins its decline. Okay. And so what we have to do is when you go back and ask people their story, right? You say, hey, how did you build that great company? Right. Well, one, you're going to get a very edited version of that story. But right. two, if you go back and instead say, hey, why did you do it this way at this point? And you know, what else did you try? Why didn't it work? Those are much better questions to ask yeah. folks that are on their way. Definitely, definitely, definitely. So where, so where does that leave somebody if they're, you're saying basically they're asking the wrong questions is what it comes down to. Right? Yes. Uh, many times I think we do. I think we ask the wrong questions. And again, that was kind of the root of the challenge that I faced in my business. And I think it's the root of the challenge a lot of business owners face is that they're not asking the right questions in the first place. And so even if they're getting the answers to their questions, they're not necessarily useful when, especially when they're, they're starting to move into a new stage. Yeah, so better questions, you get better answers. So you started out with a company that was working in the religious industry, the, the, the business of religion, basically, and you've expanded the business over the years. And so what kind of companies and industry do you work with now in terms of yeah. the scaling that you've been working with? Yeah, them? so once, uh, once we got out of that whitewater stage, we got into predictable success, I realized I'm kind of bored. Uh, I, I don't know that I want to keep doing this for this long because what I found I loved, once I could name it, once I understood what the whitewater stage was, I realized, no, I'm actually really good at this stage. I, I, and and I, I realized, hey, what I'd rather do, what I'd rather give the best years of my career to are helping other people to recognize whitewater, to identify the steps to get out of it so that they can get to predictable success as well. So uh, I, I, again, another test of what I learned from those early days was how am I going to transition from being owner and CEO to someone else leading this right. company? Yeah. And so uh, because of the work of Les's book, because of the things that we had put in place, because we knew the right systems and processes to implement, I, it gave me the time and freedom to really focus on developing the next, uh, the next generation of leaders. Okay. And, uh, and so we were able to go through a succession. And, uh, you know, the proudest point of all of that for me is that they added, I think, 15% the year after I left and 15% again the year after that, uh, and, and just continued to accelerate and flourish under the new set of leaders. Now, that's always a little hard for the ego. It's like, well, was I getting in the way of this thing? But, but that was, again, that was exactly what, that was the proof of concept. Can this thing go without me? Have I really done what I set out to do over a decade before? And, and it was, it was, it was fantastically successful. And so that allowed me to give my, my again, my best hours to uh, opening up this, this firm is called Scale Architects. And what we do is we come alongside organizations, founders and their leadership teams, business owners and their teams that are in that whitewater stage uh, that, that may not have language for it yet, but they're like, I feel a lot of those things. 
And what we do is we help them to we do help them to do a few things. The first one is to just recognize that stage doesn't mean you screwed up. It, it's actually that you did the right things. Yeah. Right. By doing the right things, yeah, yeah, you grew, and that's just a huge relief for the whole team. I think it is for everyone. And, and the the second thing that we do is help them say, okay, we're in whitewater. What do we want to do about it? Because there's actually two routes out. You can drive forward to predictable success. You can change your strategy. You can change how you show up as CEO. You can change your value for systems and processes, or you can actually scale back a little bit, which a lot of folks do, probably 60, 70%. They realize, no, we actually don't need to build a scalable. We don't need to be the next Bain and Company. We're a great boutique firm. Right. I, I don't need to build a coffee shop chain. I just want to be a barista a few days a week and have a great time doing it, build a, a strong company. So you can actually go back as well. We help folks to make that decision and then we give them the clear path to do that. Okay. So, so it's, it's a lot of fun. When you look at you, you talked about a couple of stories. So yeah. I actually just heard from a couple of clients we worked with last year. Both of them are just awesome stories. So both of these clients, we work with folks anywhere from kind of, you know, five to 250 million. So, but these two uh, that just happened to, to uh, you know, to tell me their stories recently were in the five to $10 million range. And both of them added over $1 million to their bottom line just this year. Wow. Now, the fascinating thing about that is I don't look at anyone's P&Ls. Uh, we, we don't do any real financial assessment, but the steps that we take working on things like their org chart, working on things like how they uh, their leadership style as an organization, uh, working on things like alignment, by focusing on those areas where we are making the decisions that are ultimately unprofitable. If we can turn that around, if we can provide the right context for it, and we can get them making better decisions as a team, that's where we can create these transformational results. And so for both of them, they were able to uh, add over a million dollars. It was their first time ever breaking the million dollar profit line. And both of them did it uh, in years that they were not anticipating top line growth. And, and we're also able to exceed their top line margins, one by 30% and the other by 75% in wow. a single year. Wow. Yeah. But a lot of it takes focus and dedication and awareness and understanding what's going on and not get overwhelmed. I think a lot of people just throw their hands up and they just, they just think it's going to be easy. They have this glamorous view of being an entrepreneur and then, you know, the grand opening and the store opens or you you put up a shingle and... People are just going to walk in and then they sit there and they're looking out the window going, what, what did I do? Yeah. So I, I think that that's, that's one of the problems. And I think that business owners who have achieved success, you get complacent. You think, oh, well, I deserve this. I mean, I'm obviously at the place where it's all going to run itself now. We're not going to have to worry about this. It's very common with like salespeople that I know in, in, in finance and uh, insurance and financial planning and things. I think you build a clientele and you get to the point where you think that you're entitled to not work so hard and everything comes to you and then it all falls apart and you're like, yeah. well, no entitlements. So I think yeah, and I think there's another pattern as well. And you even spoke to this earlier of a founder feeling like, hey, this is just as far as I can take my company. Maybe I need to go find a, a real CEO. And, and these two stories are really helpful because neither of these folks are what you would imagine as your big corporate CEO type, right? They are both salt of the earth, love their business, love their people, want to see the thing succeed. Yeah. No MBAs, no past experience of being a, a CEO somewhere else. But by understanding that stage, by understanding the, the way that they needed to shift and pivot, mm -hmm. both of them were able to step into that. It had nothing to do with whether or not they had what it takes. Right. It was that they didn't know what they needed to do. Well, that's common, right, exactly. Sometimes it's not that you need outside help. You just need outside awareness to let you know what's going on and take a different yes. approach. Yeah. And so the vast majority of founders that I've met out there, uh, you're not hitting a wall of your capacity and what you're capable right. of, period. Right. You're hitting a wall of what you're capable of operating the way you are today. Right. It's not fatalistic. It's not like you've just hit your ceiling. You can never build a better business. It's that you've hit the ceiling for engaging the way that you have. Right. You have to start to show up differently. And the wonderful part about it is the way that you show up is a heck of a lot easier than what you're trying to do right now.
Yeah, no, I think uh, that's a good point. That's a good point. It's not that, and I didn't want to, I, anybody listening, I don't want to lead the, lead them down the path that I think that, you know, business owners get to a point where they got to bring somebody else in. I don't think it is. I think you can learn, you can grow, but yeah, you can't do it for ob obviously you can't do it the way you were doing it before because yeah. that's what got you. To, I mean, it got you to where you are, right? But now those skill set, the way you're doing things is not the skill set to deal with the next phase of the business. And you, yeah, yeah. you can there, but that's what I meant before when I said becoming more of a student of business itself so you can learn meet people like you recognize what stages you're going through that it is a process yeah uh, you know and i look i i as a business attorney i deal with a lot of business owners the reason the podcast came about was because i mean i like to talk to people and interview meet cool people like you but i had a, the name really came about because i had a lot of clients who would come to me after the fact and say, I need your help. I got to close the doors. You know, I'm the guy who's got to go yeah. and do all the cleanup and negotiate out of everything and things like that. And after a while, it's, I started realizing, you know, the things that people don't do. And it wasn't that their business was a, was a bad idea. There are businesses that shouldn't be businesses, right? We all know that. But in general, there were good ideas that were poorly executed. And the reason that they're poor, and I mean, you know, maybe they were successful and then they fell. The mm -hmm. reason that they were, they ran into those problems is because they didn't take the time to say, how do I run a business, not this business? And how yeah. do I deal with those issues? And, and what books are out there and what people are out there? Let me find the right coach and the right business consultant. And, and, and that, that doesn't stop. That's a lifetime yeah. journey until you get to the point where either you're going to sell it, shut it down or have your kids come in, which is a whole nother. I do a lot of succession planning and a lot of things with generational stuff. And that is a painful wall to climb when you have the, the older generation that's running the business for them to just, they can't just walk out the door and say, okay, I'm fine. Good luck. They can't let go and they want to let go, but they can't, you know, they're worried about their kids. You know, it's like raising your kids, right? You can never give them enough advice. So that's, yep. yeah, that's, that's a tough one too. I've had to help families put processes in and say, okay, no, this is the way it's going to work. The kids are the board of directors. They ultimately got to vote on what you do. You could be on the advisory committee, scream and yell and give them opinions, but you got to, <laughs> you know, you got to let them go out there and see if they can fly yeah. because they're not going to be able to do it, especially if you're not here and you have a heart attack one day. So I think that that's, uh, that's an interesting thing. How can people like learn from you and find you and interact with you in terms of yeah. your Yale architects? Yeah, what I'd encourage you to get, you said you like books. Uh, my, my recent project that I, I'm super passionate about is a, a new book that we put out. It's called The Founder's Evolution. Okay. And in the same way that there are different stages that businesses and nonprofits go through, there are, there are similar stages that individuals, that the founders go through, right? Okay. Uh, all the way through succession. And, and so one of the things that happens, though, is for founders, they're largely invisible. The, right. There's no outside you know, mile marker that says the stage has changed. Right. And, and so what I did was I, I, after seeing this happen so many times, after seeing it in my own story, I mapped out where it actually changes. There are seven distinct stages from pre-launch, uh, that dissatisfied employee you talked about, to stage seven, which I call the visionary founder. And, uh, and so in the book, what I do is help folks to understand these are the seven stages. What stage are you in personally? And what are the two or three things you need to focus on now? It, it's not rocket science. It is not nearly as hard as we tend to make it. Right. And by understanding what the two or three things are that are necessary for this stage, you get a, to discover, hey, these are the 20 or 30 things I don't need to do at this stage. And so we cover all that ground in the book. We've actually made it free for anyone. They can get it at scalearchitects.com forward slash founders. Okay, we'll, leave, we'll put a link in the show notes. To get it is it also available on uh, Amazon? They can buy the book if they want. Things like yeah, that. Yeah, we chose not to go to print uh, for a okay. few different reasons. Most of it because we wanted to have control over how it's distributed and how folks get, can get their hands on it. So you can get the full copy of the book, the digital version. Okay. Yep, yep, uh, and it is much. It's longer than an ebook, but it's not quite as long as a normal book because let's face it, there's a lot of founders who aren't going to make it through a full full book so yeah, we give no. you just the short and sweet of what you need to know for each and every stage yeah my, my book which is a book about you know staying at a court and doing things right doing things in writing is more it's not a story it's a you know a, a resource 
ebook. By the way, if anybody's listening, if you take your ebook, you have to email it to like, Everybody's got a Kindle email if they have an Amazon account. You can email it to your Kindle and you can read it on your on your Kindle. So uh, if anybody's yep. listening. All right. Well, I can't uh, thank you enough. I'm glad we connected on a Friday afternoon. Um, I know you emailed me. You're like, where's the link? And we, we connected. So uh, and we had a little technical problems at the beginning. Um, but uh, you have any parting words like any last minute advice or things you want to close the show out with for the people that are listening? Because I, I think that this topic of all these things that business owners deal with, it just keeps coming up with all the guests that I have on the show. So it's obviously a common, a common thread. So any last yeah. minute uh, advice? One of the things that, that I have found founders and I've suffered my share of this as well is especially when we start to get glimpses of what can be in the future, right? What the predictable stage success stage looks like, or, or, you know, some future event, we have a tendency to become so fascinated and fixated and, and optimistic about that event that we can put our joy on hold until we get there. Uh, and, and a story I like to share with folks is, we had our first two children when I was in my mid twenties, and I loved them. They were awesome. Thank you for listening I had no to idea this episode what to do with of them. the yeah, the first couple of years of their life, I'm like, just give them back when they can kick a ball. You know, we'll, we'll have a great time. Yeah. And music. fast forward uh, about ten years, we had our third services, uh, when I was in my mid thirties, and I was just a different person. If you like at the that podcast, of course. And I really set myself to like, hey, I'm not going to do it that way. Now I was no more equipped, right? I was still a guy, like I still didn't have a whole lot. If you like offer, what you hear, please but I leave just gave myself to having joy to in the current on stage as opposed to waiting for two or three comments, years ideas down the road. For the show, and can I tell you the amount like of joy I experienced this just beautiful moment that I had with my little girl. I just look back now and there's so many things I missed. And so what I tell folks is joy is not found in a destination. It is always and forever found in the journey. And so take the stage and rather than just saying, hey, how can we get out of it as soon as possible? Look at it and say, hey, what joy is available in this stage that we won't get at a later date? Yeah, no, I mean, that's the irony of life, isn't it? You really appreciate it more as you mature, not necessarily at the end, but as you mature later on. Because like if you're having kids in your 20s, we didn't have the late 20s, but my parents had me out there 21. I don't really young. It's like a fire drill. It's like your, your hair's on fire and you don't know what you're doing. You're running around and it's hard to and you may not even have had the maturity to appreciate the things that you appreciate when you're in your thirties and forties and yeah. now my fifties, you know, when you look back. So, well, Scott, I can't thank you enough. Um, I'm going to put the link in the show notes. I encourage people to go get the book, look into predictable success, download your ebook and let's keep spreading the good word and, you know, helping people to, uh, not be successful, improve their chances of success. That's the, the best we can do, right? There we go. No guarantees. All right. Thanks for coming on, Scott. I appreciate it. Thanks so much.